we welcome you all to the second webinar of the year on series of water webinars that is co-creation of new water management paradigm which is being organized by G100 Eco Civilization Wing to drive broad based awareness and inspire relevant front runners and like-minded crowd with a three step strategy that is eco civilization water circular economy and introducing the conscious business approach to water industry for sustainability. And on this note, let me invite curator of eco-civilization, Violeta Bus, to say a few words. Thank you very much, Rajni, and hello, everyone, one more time. Uh, it is an immense pleasure uh, to uh, welcome you to this uh, really important discussion on water management. Uh, and uh, because I'm currently in a a bit remote location, I will ask Natasha to assist me with the presentation. And in case uh, my connection switches off, just carry on. Don't wait for me. Okay. Uh, but uh, I'd really like to say a couple of words just to place uh, everything in the context of uh, what Rajni already shared with you in the introduction. Uh, I believe that from many different layers, many different corners of the world, many different uh, communities, the message is very clear. We do need to reassess our foundations and ask ourselves what is really essential for life and what is essential for us to coexist on this planetary ecosystem. And definitely water is one of the topics that we immediately recognize as um, one of the key ones. Next uh, page, please. So um, we put uh, as one of eco-civilization goals uh, the universal right for fresh water as part of human rights all over the world as one of our top priorities. Um, and what we are proposing is that this becomes part of constitutional rights all over the world. We know that that's not going to happen overnight, but because of people like you, because of people who are attending these discussions, uh, we uh, eventually will manage to achieve this goal. Uh, of course, we put water along with air right for uh, clean air right for public space right uh, to access uh, global knowledge, uh, jointly accumulated one. And I'm sure more and more of uh, new wave uh, priorities will emerge away from uh, profit driven and revenue driven concepts of uh, industrial world and industrial era. Next slide, please. So just to bring um, the, the attention uh, maybe to this water management topic as uh, it will be discussed today, allow me a couple of points that uh, at least surprise me when I research this topic deeper. Uh, first of all, um, in the last couple of years, water-related topics are emerging everywhere. And unfortunately, not from a pleasant point of view. For example, um, China announced this year the first national dro uh, drought alert, uh, which was actually challenging all the hydrogen uh, energy uh, plants. Uh, US announced $1 trillion for water safeguards and restorations in the US only. Uh, we uh, do know that currently the way how we lead our agricultural strategy, uh, water absorbs 20%, uh, agriculture absorbs 20% of all uh, consumed water. But at the same time, we also are very, are, we are also very badly managing uh, our water systems. For example, I have information for the country I know best, Slovenia, where leakage of water represents 30% of the entire consumption. So uh, all these messages are just uh, inviting us to really get more engaged, to really be more collaborative in decision-making, in sharing information, and really addressing this essential element for life in a more responsible manner. Next slide, please. Uh, it was even more shocking to read how much water we consume in order to supply our um, consumer-oriented society. I bet you didn't know that for one kilogram of meat, we used 15,000 liters of water. Of course, looking from the beginning of the value uh, network all the way to the end, to the, the final consumption and this uh, the discharge of the waste. 
uh, even more shocking is for one kilogram of chocolate, we use more than 17,000 liters of water in order to produce one kilogram of consumer, consumer chocolate in the, in the form of a consumer good. Uh, on the other hand, to raise one kilogram of bananas, we need 790 liters of water and uh, interesting enough for beans, 586 liters of water. That means from this plant all the way to the final product. So there is a huge opportunity there to deal with water better, especially in the spirit of the previously shared information when we saw that the water is just not placed in the right uh, places anymore and we are having more and more troubles in running the societies the way how we set them up and, and supply them with uh, fresh water. Next slide, please. So uh, just to bring even higher attention to what uh, is changing is for the first time we are uh, recording in uh, newer history, a so-called atmospheric rivers, uh, which is a huge accumulation of water because of the melting of ice, intensive melting of ice in, in the north and south part of the planet Earth. And all these atmospheric rivers are forming and then we get floods like we were witnessing at the one in Pakistan just recently. Uh, then we have more and more uh, examples when sea is penetrating the land and uh, depriving people, of course, uh, of agriculture uh, land and even the land for being uh, for uh, housing and, and, and cities like we've experienced in Florida and that is not an isolated case. Uh, but at the same time, we're becoming more and more obnoxious as well and trying to play with the weather and more and more artificial intelligence is used for a different redirection of water, of rain. And of course, uh, int intention to control the water, to control the weather, which is a real uh, self-centric point of view uh, to be able to, with our simple minds controls that sophisticated uh, system as the ecosystem of planet Earth is. So the consequences will be very devastating in the future if we continue to do so. And of course, this appearance of water due to many interventions that are happening like fracking uh, or uh, and, and mining and similar interventions with the uh, earth layers under the soil. And, and that is becoming more and more uh, crucial as well. Next slide, please. So, if nothing else, I hope this few information is a real call to work together better. Uh, and we see that there are huge opportunities because there is lack of participatory engagement that we can offer that and achieve better results. Uh, we could use knowledge uh, better to move forward uh, together. And of course, re-question what we have done so far. Uh, one of the opportunities will be UN midterm review in 2023. I know we're a bit late, but we have some excellent uh, uh, colleagues who are uh, who have access to people who, uh, who are part of decision making, and I hope we can influence uh, their ways of thinking too. Just to put additional stress on this topic, uh, within Ecosolization Movement, we declare the year 2023 as of today. This is the first public announcement uh, as a year of water. And uh, this will be run as part of Ecosolization in Action and Manage and coordinated by our dear Rajni Bota. Uh, and I'm great, uh, Rajni, that you picked up uh, yet another challenge after circular economy. Uh, and it's good to say that the book uh, on, the, on that is coming out at the end of this year. Uh, and we hope this, to achieve something similar together with our dear, dear friend from Myanmar, Nini. Professor Nini, who is an incredible uh, warrior for uh, the topic of water and uh, really good water management. And thank you, Nini, for bringing this topic as uh, one of the essential topics to ecosystemization too. Uh, so uh, please to the last slide. Uh, this is all I wanted to really share with you. I wish you great discussions. I will be listening, but I will switch my camera off just to allow uh, a better uh, throughput and for me being easier to follow your conversations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Violeta, for setting the tone and establishing our mood for the day. And uh, before we go any further, let me show you a beautiful message.
sent by Dr. Harveen Arora, who is founder of G100, All Ladies League and Women Economic Forum from India. So can we have the video, please? Namaste, everyone. I'm Harveen. I extend my warmest regards to everyone of the G100 Eco Civilization Wing, led by our eminent soul sister, Excellency Bulch, as the global chair, and the entire team of country chairs, the Denim Club partners, all of us, all of us co creators, sisters, and brothers who have come forward with this dream of co creating a better future for everyone. And in that, water has a very important role to play. Water and women, our destinies are intertwined. So I'm so touched to see all the work that our soul sister Nini, as a water expert, is putting and enlightening all of us about what we need to do to bring ourselves in balance, our earth in balance, our attitudes and behaviors in balance. Thank you so much, sisters and brothers, for all that you're doing, all that you're doing. And I'm really looking forward to learning from all of you and being able to share all the learnings from all of you with all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Harveen. And thank you so much for this enlightening message from you. We really appreciate it. Uh, so back to our agenda of today, that is water management. So it is said that if there is a magic on this planet, it is contained in water. We can draw a great analogy between water and life indeed. Water cycle and the life cycle are one since the dawn of human consciousness and our relationship with water has been very, very profound and enriching. However, water is only renewable if well managed. And today, let me tell you, more than 1.7 billion people live in river basins where depletion through use exceeds natural recharge, a trend that will see two-thirds of the world's population living in water-stressed countries by 2025. In fact, it is already with us in 2022, and we are not sure whether we will meet the committed 17 SDGs by 2030. It is also well accepted that COVID-19 series will not completely go away and uh, we have to learn to live with it. Today, we are pleased and honored to host all brilliant speakers with us who are ready to enlighten us in a short while from now. And very illustrious Dr. Alexander Lazlo also, who is known for his work on system theories and education ecosystems. He is the president of the board of director of the Berta Lenfi Center for the Study of System Sciences. He also functioned as the director of research at the Laszlo Institute of New Paradigm Research. So without any further ado, let me introduce our first speaker of the day, Dr. Alice Bowman Dentner, who, is, who graduated as a biologist, ethologist, from Utrecht University in the Netherlands in the course of her international career in the sustainable development field. She has developed a focus on water governance, social inclusion, and gender. Alice is the co-founder of Consul, Global Vice President of the Water Research and Training, Center International Foundation. She is a long-standing member of the advisory board of Gender Concerns International as well. So Dr. Alice, over to you. morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I thank the chair for the kind introduction and the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts on how to create a water secure world and help all the SDGs along in the process. Please accept my sincere apology for not being able to be with you today in person, as I had intended. I had much looked forward to be part of this discussion. As an ethologist, which is a biologist specialized in animal behavior, I have always been particularly interested in the evolution of social behavior. How communities and societies, both animal and human, interact with their environment. And how the environment they live in 
shapes their behavior and their ways of living. Nowadays, we, we would call this a coupled systems approach. So let me start my presentation by outlining the principles of such a coupled systems approach. Our globe, the planet Earth, has four overarching natural systems. The lithosphere, the solid rocky outer part of the Earth, the hydrosphere, all the water found on, under and above the surface of the Earth, the atmosphere, which is the whole mass of gases that surrounds our planet, and the biosphere, which is all life on land, in the air, and under water. These natural systems are complex in themselves, and they interact in many ways and at different levels. They also influence the social systems that we have created and developed as human beings. We humans, we have developed into the predominant species on the planet. Both in terms of our numbers, we are soon to reach 8 billion, which is 1 billion more than in 2010. And in terms of the impact that we have on the biosphere that we are part of and on the other natural systems of our planet. Our human systems include political, cultural and economic systems. We are organized in sectors, for instance, agriculture, energy, industry or finance. And we are organized locally, nationally and internationally. Also, the human systems interact in many ways and at different levels. A coupled systems approach recognizes and accounts for all the bidirectional interactions and the feedbacks between the different natural and human systems. In our different social constructs, we are humans, we use squander, pollute, and destroy our natural resources. In an attempt to curb these negative trends, the United Nations Member States have agreed on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable and Equitable Development. The 2030 Agenda asks for integration across the different Sustainable Development Goals, which basically are goals referring to the predominant natural and human systems. And we increasingly acknowledge that water, which is in SDG 6, plays a central role in achieving all the other sustainable development goals. So what we are looking for is a water-centric systems approach to create the conditions for sustainable and equitable development. A systems approach to water management is nothing new. The times of singular supply-driven service delivery as the prevailing water governance model are long gone. In the light of the looming water crisis, water experts and policymakers developed a new paradigm to reconcile the increasingly competing domestic, agricultural, industrial, recreational and environmental water needs. The concept of Integrated Water Resources Management, IWRM, was adopted during the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, Janeiro in 1992 as the agreed way forward towards the sustainable use and equitable allocation of water resources through the combined efforts of state and non-state actors. Over the past 30 years, many countries have grappled with the complexity of integrating water resources management across those different natural and human systems. It will not come as a surprise that IWRM principles do not lead to textbook solutions. Integrated water resources management is a continuous process that is implemented differently in different geopolitical, sociocultural, environmental and economic settings. A comparative research on IWRM practice in 13 countries across the globe, I think in 2013, concludes that IWRM encompasses three types of integration, functional, institutional and societal integration. From the different reports, 
I have been reading over the years, I dare to conclude that IWRM is often too narrowly translated into institutional integration. The cooperation between the entities, mostly governmental entities, that have water management responsibilities for different sectors and at different levels in the country and transboundary. Societal integration, which is a key feature of IWM, as it comprises two of the four guiding principles, this is far less advanced. The second of the four Rio Dublin principles that provide the guidelines for IWM specifically uh, zooms in on the participatory approach, participatory approach. It reads, water development and management should be based on a participatory approach involving users, planners and policy makers at all levels. The participatory approach involves raising awareness on the importance of water among policymakers and the general public. It means that decisions are taken at the lowest appropriate level with full public consultation and the involvement of users in the planning and implementation of water projects. Rio Dublin Principle 3 zooms in on the central role of women in the provision management and safeguarding of water. But I will not go into this specific element of the participatory approach today. Reviews that the Global Water Partnership has conducted in different regions of the world show that the conditions to advance the Dublin Principles 2 and 3 are often not in place. In all the years that I have been involved in water governance issues, I have become deeply convinced that in order to achieve the sustainable use and the governance of our precious water resources that sustain our life, we need an all of society engagement and partnership. For we all hold part of the Water for Sustainable Development solution in our head. In other words, we need to prioritize collective leadership for water security. But this, I am convinced also, is easier said than done. The Chan Su approach to address this critical issue is to focus on community water security. Because water secure communities are the building blocks for sustainable watersheds. A community can be defined as a group of people living in proximity of each other, but equally as a group of people with similar social and or cultural perspectives, or a group of people sharing the same space for instance, a hospital community or a workspace. Chansu Global has developed a comprehensive approach to achieve community water security by creating the preconditions for collective leadership. Important elements of this are perform a 360 degree analysis of the social, cultural, economic and environmental situation of that particular community. Invest in the process of identifying all relevant stakeholders, clearly define their roles and responsibilities, ensure the engagement of all partners and leadership in their respective roles, abide by the principles of equity, diversity and inclusion, which is to ensure full and equal participation of women, youth, indigenous people and other equity deserving groups, building the capacity for the community of the community in its entirety. And Last but not least, develop our action partnerships to design and implement water for sustainable development solutions. And this requires strong vision and leadership and constant coordination. Um, we hope that in, in the second half of the water for sustainable development solutions action decade, we will concentrate on the enabling environment for these action partnerships at the communities that I described. And I hope that you have a fruitful discussion and I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ellis, for highlighting some of the essential key points and some guiding principles, approaches, role of community, role of stakeholders, which I personally feel are really integral to water management 
and to solve some of the complex issues related with all the water related issues that we are currently facing across the world. And uh, uh, let me just request all the participants to mute themselves because we are exper experiencing some of the background noise. And uh, in case participants have got any question for Dr. Alice, of course, we have got, uh, even in her absence, we have got wonderful speakers, uh, scholars who can answer on her behalf and express their perspective about it. So dear participants, please write down your question uh, or anything that you would love to know regarding this presentation and the whole agenda that Dr. Alice presented. So, okay, because if you have no questions, we would move further and uh, we would invite our next guest. So, I guess there is no question so far. So, now let me invite uh, someone who has immense contribution in researches and work as he has delivered outstanding contribution in the field of leadership, systemic innovation, sustainability, Dr. Alexander Laszlo, to share his perspective. The floor is all yours, sir. Thank you so much, Rajni. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for being here. And Rajni, you should get an award just for being able to pronounce uh, Bertalampi's name correctly uh, for the Bertalampi Center where I'm working. <laughs> it's not very good. Um, I apologize. I'll take care of it, sir. I'll take you, care. you pronounced it perfectly. You should get an award okay, for that. OK, OK, <laughs> OK. Thank you so much. Actually, a day before yesterday, I heard its pronunciation in every accent, British, American, because I wanted to get the right pronunciation with the name of the place. So yeah. Fantastic. That's very impressive. Look, look at the quality of people we have here. Rajni is doing this kind of research to be able to even think about how to pronounce some of the terms. I think this is a part of what we are uh, exploring here, this community that we have with a common and shared interest and concern about life, about thrivability. And clearly, the understanding that we all share that water is life. This isn't just a nice metaphor or an interesting common expression. It is truly, it is truly the, uh, a, 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 a verity, a truth. Water is life. But before I got, dive into things, probably will be a lot of water flow puns here because we'll be diving in, um, is uh, just to do some thanks. I'm delighted to see so many people here to form this community, uh, to thank also Violetta for all of her uh, overarching leadership in bringing this together, and to thank Professor Nini Tien also for being a water champion and for all that we are doing and all that she is doing and bringing us together in helping make this happen. So um, one thing I wanted to begin with is by just taking stock for all of us to think about the extent to which we are what's called uh, preaching to the choir, talking to the converted. We are all here because we all believe how important water is. So in a way, what we're telling each other is nothing new. We know this. How do we reach others? How do we connect? Um, it's great to have the reaffirmations here among ourselves and with each other about the key points. But again, this isn't uh, particularly new for all of those who are participating in this. Maybe some who the, uh, will have the recordings will actually look at this and say, oh, I didn't know these things. But this is, this is key for how do we live this change? How do we be the change, right? As Gandhi exhorted us uh, to, to consider. So um, some things that I uh, wanted just to share, and I'll we'll, we'll make this brief so that maybe we can have some conversation, um, some questions, and if not, I will definitely be able to provide more time for others to also speak, since I will be also making a comment at the end. I don't want to take too much, up too much airtime. Let me just uh, mention a few things here about uh, the notion that water is life. So if water is life, and, and I'm, I'm going to make this uh, again, a, a very clear as assertion. That means if life is sacred, that water is sacred. This is a transitive function that we, we must hold true. If life is sacred and water is life, 
then water is sacred. What is our relationship with the sacred? How do we engage with it with awe, with inclusion, not taking it for granted? I'm speaking to you from Buenos Aires, Argentina. We're just about to finish our winter and enter into spring, so I'm quite excited. The days are getting warmer. There is an expression here in Argentina that we live with the water at our backs. We give our shoulder to the water because our coastline is 4,700 kilometers long. That is longer than from London to Tehran, Iran. Longer than that trip. So it's, about, it's almost a thousand kilometers longer. So I mean, it's much longer. So there's a huge amount of water that is right next to this country. And there's very little engagement with that. There's a sense that, okay, the ocean is there, but <clears throat> it's not part of Argentina. It is not part of our country. It's not part of our identity. And yet it is so much actually a part of this, not just this planet, but in this case, I'm giving the example of a country where the water line is right up in conditions. And you can't say that uh, Argentina is just land. Uh, we just heard from uh, Dr. Elise how the different lithosphere, biosphere, hydrosphere, um, all these different spheres of life contribute to what it is as our planet. And our continent, South America, and particularly the country that I'm living in here, has is comprised of both land and water. And yet we don't act like that. We don't engage with the ocean in a way that informs who we are and how we are. So I would like to emphasize the extent to which water literacy, and this is a specific term, water literacy, how we are able to understand the flows, the transformations, the way in which water does express itself on the planet, in our bodies, in the agricultural cycles, and in truly in our very essence of being, again, as the source of life, water is life. So water literacy for me is a key component of something that I would like to request that all of us consider how do we augment our water literacy? How do we become more familiar and use this? So that it raises to awareness, for example, as I'm seeking to do here in Argentina, this idea that what the, what the ocean is not just at our backs, but the ocean is part of, and it's not, of course, just the ocean, but that's just simply a huge body of water right, right with, our, with, our, with, our, uh, with our nation here. And so for me, this uh, aspect of thinking about um, ocean literacy, water literacy, becomes a question also of systemic literacy, understanding how we are part of flows and how we are part of this process of life affirming and life creating conditions where water is at the center, at the heart of this process. So fundamentally, I think I'm going to leave you with this thought about how we can continue to explore the terms, the ways of thinking, the ways of perceiving uh, how water is life, how it is sacred through augmented water literacy. And this then for me is fundamentally about a spiritual transformation. When we think about water, when we think about life, and we make the equation between water and life, we understand it to be sacred, this becomes a spiritual engagement. In what sense is this a non-trivial spiritual engagement? How do we include our relationship so that it's not taken for granted, as I was mentioning here, with relation to the ocean in Argentina, or in our bodies, or with the water cycle, or with such crazy things as Violetta mentioned, such as fracking, which is insane. There is no sacredness in the way we treat the planet when we engage in fracking. No sacredness with how we engage with water when we do such 
uh, as, as such uh, interventions. They're brutal, they're violent. This is not the way we should engage with life, with our planet, with water. So when we think about water literacy in these terms, it becomes then a source of spiritual transformation and it augments our ability to human well on this planet. And this, as many of you know, is part of my big exploration. How do we human well? And I think if we can learn to do that through our relationship with water, it will be a huge step in our relationship with systemic integration, systemic literacy, ocean literacy, water literacy in general. So I'll leave you with these thoughts. I'll pass it back to you, uh, Rajni, and I will say a bit more at the very end. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for sharing the, your terrific and amazing viewpoint. In fact, uh, when you were discussing about how holy, how sacred water is, because we try to draw analogy with life and we need not to seek anything further it because it itself talks about how important, how substantial water is for life. So, sir, uh, there is no denial about the fact that water has played enormous role in the development of every civilization in history till date. And uh, you stressed on a point which is very interesting. That is, uh, that is, you talked about augmenting, augmenting water literacy. Do you think practically at grassroots le level, it should be integrated with the education system? Excellent question. And I think you were exactly on, Rajni. I think you picked up on a key point. Um, this, this, I think, is, is um, a way, let's put it this way. If we can learn the language of water, <laughs> this kind of water literacy, if we can learn to think in terms of flows, in terms of interconnections, ways in which water is life and spirit, if we can bring that into our education process, then this will inform all our ways of relating with life, all our ways of relating with each other. So again, this will bring so much to what uh, Professor Nini Tien also is experiencing, and I'm sure will share as well, is the questions of the strife between humans. The strife that we find ourselves in when we experience war or distress. Water is not at war. <laughs> it's the opposite. It is life. So when we learn the language of water, and we bring this into our schooling systems, I think it can do much to allow us to human well in much more profound ways. Thank you for the question, excellent. Thank you for answering it, sir. And uh, if we haven't received any more questions, then we can always proceed towards our next presentation. And uh, it's time to invite our next speaker, Sonia Kloxis, who is an innovator, co-creative leader and transformation manager best-selling author of uh, Energy Inside Leadership and the AEIOU of Leadership and initiator of the global community of AEIOU leaders apart from being eco-civilization from teachers millennia, who started her career as an engineer, but very soon moved to managerial positions. So Sonia, can't wait any more to listen to you. Thank you, Rajni. And thank you, Alexander. I always enjoy listening to your thoughts. It's such a nurturing way to understand more about the water literacy and the language of the water. And with this, I remembered, uh, I think it is an Indian saying, it goes something like this, you don't need to push the river. The river will flow by itself. And yes, we need to understand the flow and embrace the flow. I will start with a very um, tough demand or request uh, that water is really a fundamental right for everyone. And Slovenia did very good job on this way. Six years ago, our parliament voted for a new article in our constitution and put that every citizen has the right 
to drinkable water. But last year, we needed somehow to defend this right. And luckily, um, young generation, youth were able to mobilize the nation and we requested a referendum. And on this referendum, we said that we don't want any exceptions here. And all the constructions uh, near the lakes and river banks is now really prohibited. This is a great way to secure this source of our life and to really show that water is sacred. And as Professor Nini said, if there's a magic on this planet, it is contained in water. And we need to find this magic in people too. And if I go from Slovenia to the other part of our planet, to New Zealand, we can learn from this Maori expression as well, because they say, I am the river and the river is me. And we know that Maori present themselves with their tribe, with their mountain and with the river because they understand they are spiritually connected with the river, with their mountains, and of course, with their tribe. And this river is Fanganui River, the first river that received the status of legal person. And this status was based on the understanding that river is also a living organism a living whole, and that it is also a spiritual ancestor of Wanganui tribe, Wanganui river. I think we should follow such examples. And we have also another examples from this part, from New Zealand. Uh, for example, uh, Maori elder, Ruth says that in us, there are two rivers and we are united by the two rivers. Now I will go back to Slovenia because I believe that how we can be united by two very different rivers, uh, it is shown by the example of our longest river which is Sava River. One spring of the Sava River comes to a surface as a waterfall from the really sacred valley of seven lakes near Triglau. Triglau is our highest mountain. And the other part of Sava River comes to the surface on the other side of Triglau in the lake in the Lake Zelensky as a plenty of small bubbles through the uh, layer, chalk layer of this uh, lake. And both very different sources are connected 40 kilometers further. And together as a strong flow they flow across Slovenia, across Croatia, across Serbia to make a confluence with the Nup. The Nup being the second largest river in Europe flows through 10 different countries. And the Nup, the name comes from the indigenous people, from Celts, because then or Don are the names of Celtic gods. So river as a god. And as indigenous people are teaching us that we need to think for seven generations ahead, the new 
can also teach us that we need to think for seven countries ahead because we are all depending on water as a life source. And the NUP on its delta, it covers mostly a lot of area in Romania, but also part in Ukraine. So we see that also in Europe, water is connected also war and peace. And the war shows us the tragic face of humanity that is not able to sit together and to co-create solutions that will benefit for all. That is why eco-civilization movement is so important. And here are the, the five pillars of the model created by Violeta Bult. And this model sheds the light to a new path that is needed. We need to connect and collaborate. And water shows us, shows us how, with confluencing of ideas, of approaches, of different thoughts, we can really create a powerful flow. And this flow with its delta can feed a lot and can bring also back to the ocean. And this regenerative cycle can be really supported with collaboration and with different attitude. To do this, to collaborate more, we of course need not just mind shift, but also heart shift and also spiritual transformation, as Alexander said. And to make this shift from egocentric to ecosystemic approach, from competition to collaboration, from exploitation to regeneration, from doing business as usual to living, to creating on purpose, from managing with power over to leading with love, with aroha. I use here Maori word because it is broader. It means love, compassion, empathy, generosity. And to make this heart set, this is something that it, it is connected with the new leadership code. And key questions here are, where from do I lead? Do I lead from fear of scarcity? Or do I lead from love to create abundance for all? How do I perceive interlinkage and inter interdependence? Where do I search for meaning? How do I enact my responsibility? And how do I build relationships? How do I build relationships? Because if we are connected, if we understand that we are all part of the system, then we together can create different system. And this new leadership code is connected to the very old wisdom in the earth, to indigenous wisdom from five continents. That's why the words Aroha, Ape, Ikigai, Oikos, Ubuntu are here to invite us to make this mind and heart shift, to lead from love, to hold the space for creativity and innovations, to lead with ecosystemic view, to see how each our decision affects others, to lead with a mission and to create a meaning for all of us, to create shared value for all stakeholders, and with this also sustainable business. 
and to create trust-based relationship for co-creation. And if we really deploy this leadership code, then we create a collaborative, a collective will and action that can drive on the indigenous wisdom, that can also supply complete new thoughts, ideas, approaches to the ocean of a new wisdom. And from this on, we can use the source to collaborate and to co-create. And with this, we can become a good ancestors for our descendants. So this AEIOU acronym of five indigenous wisdoms that we need to remember and use in our daily lives, this also leads to a new water management paradigm. And yes, we know what is needed. Now we also know how we can create a collective action because new water management paradigm is not possible without a collection, collective action. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonia, for such a comprehensive presentation. And while you were speaking very clearly, and quite extensively about deploying collective leadership at collaborated level. I was thinking that this webinar is being watched by many individuals who are not being led by any leader. At an individual level, what would be your suggestion? How can we move from theoretical perspective to practical perspective? At an individual level, just look around and see where you can be helpful, what you can nurture, nurture what you can support to be better. And with this, with doing this in your family, at your uh, office, at your workplace, then this is uh, the start of a new movement because other people will, will also start to see what can be supported what can be nurtured. And this is very practical. Yes, indeed. Yes. Thank you so much, Sonia. And uh, now we are going to introduce our next speaker, Professor Dr. Kinlini Thin, who is a water management professional with 44 years of uh, experience in the water sector globally. And uh, she is specialized in inclusive water governance, IWRM, and hydroinformatics. Dr. Mini has more than four decades of experience in the water sector, from beginner to the veteran convert to the subject of eco civilization. Since 2021, she concentrated in co creation of eco civilization at eco civilization country chain mining. Over to you, Mini. Thank you. Thank you, sister. And thank you very much uh, to all the speakers, our global chair, G100 chair, and the audience, our participants. Although I can't see you all now because I'm screen sharing, I am grateful and humble that I can share my ideas to you. Today, I want to share a new water management paradigm. Just like our global chair said, it's our dream. And it is also my dream. And I want your dream as well. Okay, so let's dream about it. And the reason why we have to think about is because our world is drastically changing. I'm going to get problem with uh, changing the slide. And now I get it. Oh, wonderful. I always get stuck. So you see, I start with the negative. Now, the changing world, I also 
will explain in two parts. The first is negative, you know, then we will go to the positive. Before that, I would like to echo the speakers who spoke before me. What is life? Yes. And in which way, let me elaborate what is an integral part built in life support system. Even inside my body, 75% is water and the food we eat water and we name it. So let me put my own, yeah. Of all existence on this planet, humans, animals, aquatic animals, plants, forests, ecosystem, and the nature at large. We have the drastically changing world. And I would go like forever, but we can categorize under six negative areas. Climate change, COVID, it never ends. We think it will end in 2022, but it never ends. And the war, the war in Ukraine, loss of nature, everyone feels it, be in Europe or Asia or US or wherever we live. Financing, this is a monster. I will elaborate later. And human behavior, we were very, good at blaming everything on flood and drought and uh, lack of money and the government and my neighbor and even my mom if I cross with her. So that is the problem. To capture these all inside, all under these six negative areas, I have explained up with the bullet points, but for the sake of time, I will not read out. Please let me go to the next. This is much better. This is positive because we are also running after the drastically changing world with our possible human capability. We created the technology. We created the aeroplane. And now we are making a tourism to the space. Wow, it's quite okay. But for me, I think we miss the actors because all of them are doing by human being. But we human being forget to go back to our inner self and see how good we are or how badly we behave. And that is why in the first background slide, human behavior is listed under the negative feature. And now we have positive feature. And we human beings are wonderful because we did the nine consecutive World Water Forum. And these are all captured in the concept paper. So please let me offer all these details, uh, three UN decades, and also our global chair said, next year is the midterm review of sustainable development goals. Okay, we are going to have a big, big conference and we have to go and tell what we think and how we improve. So these are the achievements from bullet one, two, three, four. And circular economy movement is the outstanding. You see, this is if, if with a big if, capital if, and with a big bull, if we achieve, we could solve half of the problem of the world. If it is a billion problem, we will have it. But still, we need to go back to the human being and question the leadership. That is why G100 mil mission million, eco civilization, world economic, uh, sorry, women economic forum, NAEIOU, digital currency, systems science, thriving, collective leadership, AI and AI, very interesting. 
artificial intelligence and the Amnesty International. Both are AI. Gender equality and inclusion, peace and love is on the agenda. So the new water paradigm, we suggested the following. Financing and human leadership styles should be changed radically. Details will be described in the paper. So the water management paradigms, five were done until 2000, thanks to Professor Ellen Hall. And the six is what is happening current. You talk, uh, you heard about Ellis talking integrated water resources management. We were always thinking of that. And now, coincidentally, one of the slides uh, from Sonia, source to see, and that is, you see, wonderfully coincided, our source to see approach in IWRM. Again, dams are not good, dams are bad, dams are very good. That debate is now going to be more positive with the future dams because we apply the systems thinking. But we could not go deeper like uh, Dr. Lazaro has explained. So we will add his expertise inside it. So in the future, a new paradigm will be three-ply, socio-technology, systems science, and spiritual transformation. Begin with the leadership principles. Thanks to Sonia, she has coded the human leadership code for new water resources paradigm. So this is the actually scientifically the last slide, but there will be little to more. And do we have a time? Maui Huam Lamayaro. How well I'm doing with the, I, I don't see the stopwatch. No problem, Nini. Uh, we have time. Don't worry. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So we are now going into the sustainable development, but um, not in the UN style, but in the eco-civilization style. But it doesn't mean that we negate the UN style. No, we complement the UN style. This way, sustainable development in co-creation, that will be the, the term we use. And inclusiveness, multi-layer co-creation. I'm the boss and I do the best, but you follow me or you support my idea, not that way. We will write down the screenplay together. We will co-create at the communities with the non-governmental organizations, academia, research institutes, and the national governments. So the first step in the uh, pinky parks, individuals, roles, and responsibility in sustainable water management. And there, Sonia's code go perfectly into it. Each individual should be the water person, and they should do what they think right. And that righteousness should also be guided by their own religion, be Christian or be Buddhist or be Islam or be no religion, whatever. But they have to have the water ethic. So they are committed individuals. Then these committed individuals live together. It is the like-minded communities, then become societies, then become country fellows, then become global citizens, then become citizen of the universe. In the middle blue circle, we have to hit this radical change of the finance. Each and every government, they say, I'm going to do education this good and uh, health. So in US, every presidential election debate overwhelmed with education budget and health care. 
I think water should be in with the same uh, seriousness, but I do not see same amount or percentage of the GDP. What I'm seeing is the budget item of water budget of a single nation, it has to be stated. Then develop water uh, circular economy, practice locally, because we have a very popular saying that on paper, so everything is on paper and law is on paper and the yield is on paper, the, the, the agricultural yields and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Everything is very good in written form, but nothing in practice. Therefore, we have to sandwich community and the government for this radical change in financing. Then we go to the sustainability of water industries. Water industries are very um, in the very difficult position. Sometimes we praise them, sometimes we blame them. Actually, they don't deserve both. They are doing their own thing. If they do with the circular economy way, they will be the great contributor to the water wall and the whole world. Therefore, we only need to discuss with them, like uh, Dr. Lazaro said, we need the consciousness, we need to talk with them, communicate with them, and not preaching the converted. Voila. So then we have two boxes underneath. It is eco-civilization. We would like to do this sustainable development, co-creation in the style of, or in the form of eco-civilization. Eco-civilization has a clear mission. First is to create planet Earth as an eco zone of the universe with its rich biodiversity at its core. The second to populate the universe by using technology, curiosity and greatness. Here I read this sentence as a human greatness. We wanted to be a great manager, but we don't want to be a great human being. So from efficient to greatness, it is eighth habit of greatness by Stephen Covey. So, you know, the books really uh, guide us to be good. AI leaders, there is a book, WEF, Women, no? Women Economic Forum, and also many more. And Buddha teaching said, a well-trained mind brings happiness. No other happiness is beyond peace. I quoted by Lord Buddha. Therefore, you see in this uh, slide, I just put the logos and everything I know of, and you will see how limited my knowledge is. Actually, the real like-minded organizations are more than one million because we can't know it, we don't know it. Therefore, Connectathon come in the way. 22nd and 23rd of September, please join Connectathon. We will see the unknown world where our like-minded live. We don't even know their name and how do they look. So it seems seemingly impossible before the completion, but let us be very, very positive. My final note is with the gratitude and remembrance of our late professor, who is the creator of hydroinformatics. He can see 30 years ahead. Every project exists in an outer physical world and in an inner world of the collective mind of stakeholders and the creation of the communications environment in which the two worlds begin to align is essential to success. Thank you very much. Thanks, moderator. Thank you so much, Mini, for giving your perspective so candidly. 
with regard to water and other social political issues directly and indirectly you try to touch upon many courts and we know that you have been very very active on various fronts and if time permits we would certainly love to know especially your efforts for water management in your community so but before that we have got one more presentation because it's last but not the least presentation and we have amazing amazing ferial puran with us who is an imagineer she rallies people around the idea of a better future she imagines a sustainable world where we all are truly happy ferial engages authentically with others to provoke them to go on their on evolutionary internal journey where they reconnect with self others nature and the divine she is eco civilization wing from trichester scotland social system lab strategic advisor and scottish chapter leader dear ferial we welcome you wholeheartedly over to you Thank you so much, Rajni, and everybody here for having me. Thank you, Nini. I appreciate your love and friendship, and every one of these wonderful people, your esteemed colleagues, and it's so wonderful. Well, to actually get to sit and listen to all of you because you've given me loads of ammunition now, <laughs> right? Thank you so much for the wisdom, Sonia. It was incredible, and Alexander and Nini, and I think when I listen to each of you, I realize all of you come back to it starts in. me that's what i heard and so today i really want to talk about wisdom my i want to share my screen really quickly but my subject is about finding like how do we change this paradigm nini asked us she said we need a new paradigm for water management so for me it's about how do we do that what in us has to change because so many of them you know talked here and said how we've contributed to all the stuff that's happening on the planet and but how do we then now in this next phase how do we evolve to be the kind of beings that can have this different paradigm that we need for the future and that's what i want to share about a little bit today so before i do that i will share my screen so a wisdom nurturing approach to the new management paradigm so ata sharma who is someone i like to follow his work of he he talks about an open mind an open heart and an open will and i think that is the greatest place we can start because what we need for this next phase is nothing like we've had before or known before which means if we do not open our hearts our minds and our wills to something new we're not going to get there so that would be my first thing to say in everything if you would today make that decision if you want to be part of changing our trajectory where we're heading next because we're kind of in trouble right now we already know this as alexander said i'm preaching to the choir right now and we feel it and we see it and we hear it on the news and actually right now I'm still recovering from covid so this is the first time I've ever had it in all this time so you might hear some coughing in between I apologize <laughs> but I've got my water here <laughs> but I'm saying that again says like they said it hasn't ended there are just more things piling on each day so in other words we're in trouble what are we going to do it's up to you and it's up to me Now today I want to talk as I said about wisdom and there is this little word in the English dictionary I recently came across it's called sapiens it comes from the root word homo sapien and do you know what sapiens means sapiens means wisdom finding in other words our entire journey on this planet has been about finding wisdom it wasn't i mean think about it what all the things we learned so maybe where we are isn't a bad place right maybe it's just a place <laughs> right in the sense that maybe all of our journey has brought us here so that we would learn we would learn about who we are we would learn about who the other beings that we share this planet with and we would learn about our place in this space right but 
what we and 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 when we look at it, we, I dare say that at the moment we have incredible, incredible amounts of complex challenges that we have to find solutions for, as these others have also mentioned. Now, um, there's good news. I think Nini said that, and then there's also bad news. But I'm going to start with the good news. The good news is that we have been solving challenging problems for as long as we have been here on this planet. So in other words, we know how to do that. Evolution is built into us the very in, in our very DNA, the ability to do that. So all we need to do, as Sonia reminded us, was we must remember what we learned. Now, the bad news <laughs> is that in this learning process over the eons of being here, you know, we have journeyed through centuries of relentless human activity. Now, this has resulted in a lot of positive things. It's brought us to be the apex predator <laughs> on the planet right now, and, and we get to control and, and move a lot of stuff around. But this it has also really negatively impacted the natural world to the, to the extent that without radical system changes, unfortunately, humanity's life support system is under serious threat. And, of, and then we have the speed at which these our governments and our big businesses operate is constrained by entrenched, ineffective, unequal market practices. It's ineffective. And, and it's, it's based on a lot of self-interest because I think some of our other colleagues said as well, we now operating from fear. And that fear pushes that self-interest because I need to protect myself. Right. But I'm not just an individual. I'm individual and I'm collective. And if I'm not going to take care of my this is the wisdom here. If I'm not going to take care of my brothers and sisters around the world, I'm not taking care of me. Excuse me, Faria. Uh, you don't see any change in the slide. Are you changing your slides? I'm not yet changing my slide. <laughs> OK, OK. Thank you. Then, then oh, please yeah. carry on. Yeah. And I think if ever there was a time now for us to get together and really work together, it is now. But how do we do that? So it is time for bold, transformative, out-of-the-box steps that can mobilize all of us to take responsibility for our world. Um, now, why do we need this kind of paradigm shift that we're talking about? Is it, what is the need for that? Right. So what I'd like to talk about is that at the moment we have eight, almost eight billion people on the planet. This is my last count. I checked it on the Internet. Citizens, eight billion or seven point nine 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 five. This was a few days ago. Now it's a lot more. In fact, it increases by two hundred thousand people every day. That means yesterday, uh, you know, we had less. We had two hundred thousand today. It's. 200,000, in fact, today was 215,000 people larger than yesterday. And this development puts an enormous pressure on Earth's resources. And we're going to need to find sustainable ways of living fast because we are running out of time. Now, we are dependent on the Earth's ecosystem to survive. You know, they, we, earlier they said, this is our most precious resource. It is sacred. And without it, we die. Three days without water, we are dead. I'm saying that really loud so we get this. Three days without water, we are dead. In other words, we're running out of time. And why, why do I say that? I say that because... Um, I looked at some research again, um, and it was done by some um, some very intelligent people <laughs> around the world, and they come up with a figure of 17 years, and I just added that for effect, 115 days, nine hours. In actual fact, it's not for effect. It's actually, there's a running tally that shows this. They've done several studies and looked at it from every side and saying, we have something like 17 years of fresh water left to drink. That is, yeah, a difficult one to swallow. Excuse my pun. <laughs> so I'm saying that we really have to think about this. This is why we need a different paradigm. 
because we're not playing games here. We're talking about our very lives and not just ours, but all the other creatures that share this planet with us. Because we've evolved to become these apex predators, we now have the responsibility for this. Will we take that? Will we be these, I call it, you know, will we be able to sapientate? Will we be able to take that knowledge, both the knowledge that Sonia shared about the past, but also the knowledge that we are now gaining now, the new stuff we're learning, because all the time we're learning new stuff. But are we prepared to transcend our paradigm? So this was the, 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 the information I just gave you was according to Professor Benjamin Savako of Denmark's Aarhus University. He and his team did all of that study um, about, you know, how much water we've actually got left. So I'm back to the good news. The good news <laughs> is still that we have opportunity to change this if we act fast and if we act now. So the late Danella Meadows, she's such a hero of mine as well, and she's done such incredible work. Now she has passed on, but her work, her wisdom remains with us. And she said that our greatest leverage point for system change, which is what we need in water, is that we have the ability to shift paradigm, worldview, and, 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 and that shifts our systems, but we need a change in our values. So it, she says that our, our greatest leveraging point is our ability to transcend our current paradigms because our old ways of thinking cannot get us where we need to go. So recent research on things like social tipping points, it points to the fact that traditional inner transformation shifts occur over a span of decades. So this is problematic for us, right? If we're running out of time and the thing is ticking over there, then we can't really take decades to do that inner transformation that we need. So how do we, how do we kind of do that a little bit faster? So, so this is the reason that um, we need kind of shorter social tipping point interventions. And in this vein, kind of, this is why my team and I, so my team consists of personal business and community development specialists. And we went to work about four years ago and decided, okay, if this is the case, because we already saw this coming and we decided, okay, well, what can we do to help? What can we do to bring our expertise to this and help for this to, to, to kind of happen? So we worked with um, a group of people, um, a gentleman in particular, a friend of mine called James Gian Wong. He kind of developed this little principle called SRG, stop, reset, go. We call it SRG for sure. But we worked with him and we said, okay, if we took this concept, because it's a really great concept that he had, if we took this and we looked at how we can take that and make that into a wisdom, into a tool that could actually help us make that kind of paradigm shift. Because what Sonia was talking about was, a lot of the kind of wisdoms and but how do you get to that open heart, open will and open mind to even see that you need this? How do you get to, Alexander talks about wisdom. I mean, sorry, about sacredness of water. So many humans on this planet, we don't care what we do with water. We don't, how do we get to that place where we even understand or can have the consciousness level to know that this is sacred? that we are sacred, that everything on this planet, every being is sacred. Look at the way that we treat each other. Wars, we kill each other for no reasons. We just decide, I want Russia, I want this piece of land, I'm taking it because I can. And don't we do that? In, he's doing it on this big universal, kind of this global stage that we can view, but a lot of our own wars are fought in our own homes. I want you just to think about that for a moment. Are we part of that? And I know that many in here, Alexander said, this is the choir. I know many of us here are doing the work in, inside of us, but it's not enough because we have a whole world of people that are not doing the work, <laughs> right? That are, they unfortunately in a system, they, they're like these rats on a, a treadmill. I, I find myself some days there too. 
But because I've been working inward, I have the consciousness level to pull myself out of it and go, hey, Farrell, what are you doing? So I'm saying to you, today, I want to introduce you to a little tool that we designed. Um, and it is a wisdom finding tool. It's not a tool that is that is linear. It's not something you can say, okay, you could do step one, two, three, and then we're going to go. It's something that happens all over the place, all around you, every day, in everything you do. And is everybody seeing my screen very clearly? So I'm just checking. Because I see something on my screen here that shouldn't be here. Yes, yes. You, you see, see your screen. Yeah. Okay, great. So what is Stop, Reset, Go? Stop, Reset, Go, as I mentioned, is this wisdom finding tool. And the first, so he divided into these three steps. As you can see, it uses kind of the colors of the, of the, you know, the traffic light. So it's a nice, easy little mnemonic. Anybody can use it. A child that's four or five years old is already learning, you know, red, green, orange, you know, kind of thing. And, and knowing we can stop, we say go. So it's something that can be applied very, very simply in any scenario from a three-year-old to, you know, my grandmother has just turned 104. So <laughs> bless her heart. And um, we've divided it kind of into these three steps. So the first step is when you recognize that any kind of harm is being done, you have the responsibility to stop. So in our own lives, let's take it back to water. What are we doing there? What are we doing that's not good? But then take it back to our own lives because it starts there, as we said earlier. So what in our own lives do we have to stop doing because it is not delivering what we need? Next, the second one is we start to test alternatives that allowing for us because sometimes those those things that we're doing right they they actually give us a benefit if you look at fossil fuels there's a benefit for us but at the same time it's producing a serious challenge for us so in other words we're asking the question what 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 are the alternatives to what we're using and we start to test those alternatives and we to do that we have to reset our values our principles our norms and our actions and then we start to test these, right? And then the final step, which is. Okay, may, I, may, I, may I just request you to just hurry up? And then if you could wind up a little Great. faster. Yeah. No problem. So our final step is that once we've seen any of those alternatives working, we then move in the direction of implementing them. So finally, I'll just wrap up and say, I'm not going to go any further. I'll wrap up and say, if we want to have a different paradigm for water and for every other system, then we're going to have to stop, reset, and go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheria. And uh, very comprehensive, and very spontaneous, full of energy, like always. You are 10 on 10 on every front. And uh, I, I'll definitely have a question for you since I feel that you are the right person to ask this question. But before that, uh, may I request Dr. Alexander to express his opinion, his perspective on all the presentation that we have had so far, because this was the last presentation of the day. Good. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep this also brief in summary. My opinion is that this is great, <laughs> but also that it is much needed. Uh, so, yeah, it, you know, you, you did mention also about uh, Ferriel's energy, and, and that is something that's so palpable. You know, you can, when Ferriel talks, you have, you're, you're, you're there. <laughs> she's, she's alive with all this, so it's really nice. And I think that this is the spirit of our engagement that all of us can bring to this. This is about community. It's about our community of life. It's about uh, our planet, our now, and our future. Uh, it is all of these things. I, th I really don't think there's anything more important. Um, so that we are here and doing this, we have to do this in a spirit of love, a spirit of love of life 
a love of the sacred, as we've talked about before. And in that process, we have to remember that it is also fun. But I consider this what we consider, what we might think about as serious fun. This isn't just to go and splash in the water, but it is to be able to celebrate the water, to celebrate each other. And so just to pick up on a few things that I've, I've heard throughout the presentations, uh, we've had, uh, I, I don't think I'm gonna go one by one. I'm just gonna pick up on a few things that came out uh, uh, just for the time of things here. So um, uh, Sonia was talking about the way in which there are two rivers in us, right? And these are ancient uh, explorations as well that they will, they will say this. And that uh, there's a river in us and that one that we are flowing through and being flowed in. And Violeta even pointed out the atmospheric river that is actually a river uh, of water in the sky which is uh, an amazing thing. Um, uh, Professor uh, Nini talked about how we have to um, bring these rivers into confluence, that we must bring them into relationship. Well, this is the system's perspective after all, isn't it? Because from the system's perspective, it is all interrelated. Why? Because it's interdependent. And this is almost self-evident, but maybe only to those who are here, as we've talked about, we have to remember that as Feriel just mentioned, and I think as all of us have been saying, without water, there is no life, right? So the interdependence is real. And that means the interrelation is real. So how do we relate? How are we interrelated? How do we celebrate this confluence? So something that was talked about also is about uh, the, the mind shift. I think Tony, uh, Sonia was also talking about this in this way. Mind shift, and, the, and Feriel picked up on this in terms of the mindset. And we, I think, can think about not only the, our mindset and what is the mind shift that is needed, but then what is also the skill set that is appropriate. And Professor Nina was talking about this as well. Um, uh, how do we engage? And then this comes fundamentally to what I think everyone was also talking about is the heart set. So mindset, skill set, and heart set, these come into educational frames very strongly. There are definitely three domains that we can work in, and there's many more, but I just want to highlight from what I've heard in, this, uh, in these presentations, three domains. There's self, self as instrument. Feriel to talk about how it begins here. This is what uh, Professor Nini, actually all of us are mentioning this, it begins at home, but at home meaning with ourself. Self as instrument, we are the instrument to sense what is going on, but also the sapience that uh, Ferriel was talking about. How do we engage with the water wisdom in ourselves? That's one level. The second level, I want to bring this into the notion of how do we learn about this with others. So this is education, but not just formal education, informal education as well. We can think about this in terms of lifelong learning, but also life-wide learning. Life-wide learning is learning in all of our contexts, learning in our world, remembering that the water is not just at our back here, <laughs> turning our back to the, turning our shoulders to the water in Argentina, but remembering that we, it is right there, part of our world, and we, we have to relate these rivers. And then the third level is the level of projects, the levels of what we are bringing into the world, what initiatives we can bring. And Professor Nini did talk about this in a very beautiful way. So I think to summarize this, I would like to mention that the, there's a need for systemic innovation that brings into play our understanding of the interdependence that we have with water. This kind of systemic innovation is informed by a relational intelligence. What is this relational intelligence? Where I was mentioned the interdependence and the interrelationship we have with water. And this then can be promoted and augmented by water literacy. How do we achieve water literacy? Through processes such as stop, reset, and go, when we can actually take stock and then reorient and then engage. Uh, these are powerful frames. 
fundamentally, and as I'm, I'm representing both the Bertlanke Center for the Study of System Science, but also the Laszlo uh, Institute of New Paradigm Research. And that new paradigm is a paradigm of interbeing. Fundamentally, it is a spiritual call. And that call is one that we must not just first hear, but second answer. So if this is a spiritual call, and if this is something that we can and are called to engage in because of the urgency, every one of the speakers talked about the urgency that we have here, then I would like to put the emphasis here now on the global project that we must engage with to make this happen. And this global project is one that Professor Nini has just been talking about in greater detail. And I think the idea is how do we connect with this kind of global project that Professor Nini has been talking about. And I think this is where we can bring this from self to learning, education, into actionable projects, which may cover all of those frames. So this is truly the systemic integration for the systemic innovation that I think is most called for now. It's an exciting time. It's a challenging time. It is a concerning time, but it must be a joyful time. I mean, if, if when I think about water, I think about joy. Water is, is joy as well. So bringing this into the frames of celebration. Um, and again, finally, just to reemphasize the launch of a global project on water literacy and on water engagement and action. And again, I think uh, particularly what Professor Nini has been presenting is part of leading the way for this to happen. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ranjni, and everyone here. Uh, let's let's do this together. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. And uh, I request once again all the participants if they have got any question for our uh, for our speakers, uh, you are most welcome to write down your question. We are here to answer them. Uh, because we still have, uh, uh, I, I, if I'm not wrong, we still have 20 more minutes. Yeah. So, Kariel, uh, I just wanted to ask you, and I might look a bit going off on a tangent when I say that uh, you have spent a substantial part of your life in South Africa, if I'm not wrong. So, you are very well connected, you know about the culture, you know about the tradition. Let me know that the current situation of water that the whole country is facing, especially in some towns where the water has totally gone to zero level. In the, in the light of wisdom that you discussed, how could that element of wisdom could have saved them from this situation? So that's a very, very interesting um, question because actually the area that suffered the most with that uh, drought was actually where I was born and raised in the Western Cape of South Africa. So I lived there for you know a, a huge part of my, my life. Um, I've now lived in Europe for two decades, um, Scotland in particular. So I've gone from the very dry to the very wet. <laughs> but anyway, the thing is that... Um, in South Africa, I remembered visiting. So I want to make this personal, right? Because water is personal for us. And I went to visit my family and it was shocking. And, and everybody listening here, I want to say to you, until you're experiencing this, you're not going to know what life's like without water. So we could think what it's like, but when you've got to live it. So my family was literally washing in each other's bath water. And they're not poor, right? So in other words, they didn't have a choice. People were standing in queues, getting water. They, you know, all of a sudden the water, the, it, the prices of, of bottles of water and things started increasing. My mom would take the buckets and buckets of, of the, wa the water that they'd washed in. And then she would be taking it to her garden. She didn't have any grass, so she didn't have to wait all of that. So she had all her pot plants and she threw her water in. And the thing is they got to the point where they had 45 days left of water, of that was going to be it. So it wasn't the whole country that was suffering that incredible drought. It was just the Western Cape in particular. And this is a region that growing up, I have never experienced this. We always had abundance of water. So what I'm saying to you is these people came in, but the thing that saved them actually was they did pull together. 
I watched them and I, as I said, they were bathing in each other's waters, doing all kinds of things and innovation started happening. But I want to ask us, why do we have to wait till we have 45 days of water left? Because we're smarter than this. We know this happens. And right now, even in India, Rajni, you know, certain parts of it, 55, 55 degrees Celsius, when are we going to wake up at 50 degrees, things die. So I'm saying, this is what I mean. So the, the wisdom here is, Stop, reset, go. Look at what's happening. Open up our eyes. See, not just in our own space, because I live in Scotland where water is pouring from the sky all the time. But Scotland is not going to save the whole world. Mm -hmm. So in other words, there is a moment. Scotland is going to be in that 17 years without water. So very quickly, uh, there is one participant who has raised his hand. So can we bring that participant uh, and his question here? Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Kasa Abarra from uh, Ethiopia. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you for your invitation for this uh, webinar because I've got uh, many concepts related to water resource management, especially this uh, new uh, way of water management. So I thank us, uh, all of you for the presenters. And I have got, uh, for example, for open-mindedness, all of the participants or the presenters uh, give us the information in world wide without discrimination, without any aesthetic, without any influence on human beings. They only think us as a human being, how to serve our society in our world related to water source management. Then the other one is uh, live together and live for others. Since all you are a specialist or any professionals, that you are not thinking about for yourself, but you are talking about how to live for others, how to serve others. This is one of the way how we think as a wisdom that someone uh, presents, I think, uh, Perla. Therefore, this information is a very interesting idea for me since I'm uh, uh, working or working in my PhD on uh, hydrological drought management uh, in Ethiopia. Now, I'm not finishing my thesis on the progress. Maybe in this year, I will make com complicate that uh, dissertation. And I get many feedbacks from how to manage our water sources in globally. The other one, or my question is, what is the ultimate goal of this webinar? Of course, we discuss here, we think or we raise many issues related to uh, different ways of uh, water source management. But in today, our population is increasing rapidly. That causes a problem for water sharing. There is also a natural hazard related to droughts. This a drought paradigm and that of water sharing combining will create a crisis of water or scarcity of water in many peoples in different areas. For example, in this uh, year in China, for example, in our country, in Ethiopia is in Somali region and some parts of Oromia regional state. Many peoples are scarce on water, scarcity due to droughts. So how to integrate those drought problem or natural disasters with the available water sharing uh, problems between different nations or uh, country across rivers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kasa. Thank you for your question. Uh, sir, may I request you, may I direct this question to you, Dr. Alexander? Yeah, um, uh, sure, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> so, and I'm going to redirect it to Professor Nini in just a moment, because again, I think a lot of this has to do with being able to take and bring forward major project initiatives. And this is exactly, the, why are we having this seminar right now? It has been called and it was designed, I think particularly from Professor Nini's uh, um, uh, efforts uh, to uh, bring us together, not only to raise our awareness and to share that, but also to bring us into action together. Uh, this is the need. Ferial has also talked about the new paradigm that is needed. It's not just new paradigm thinking. 
It's new paradigm being, interbeing, and that means new paradigm action. How do we engage with this? Um, I'm going to put here in our chat there, uh, also just after Ferial has put the, uh, a, a comment, but let me put here also this idea of the flow between connective intelligence, which is the first thing. We must know how to connect with water. Connect, remember that we are connected. Remember that we are connected. And that we can then leverage into collective intelligence, like Ferry was talking about also the, the, the um, approach that Donella Meadows brings in terms of understanding this uh, uh, frames of paradigms of, of thinking. That must be complemented by collective empathy. Often we think of water just as this thing that we use. How can we understand it as something sacred? relate to water as a living source, and then um, bring this also into collective wisdom. This, I think, is the higher hope. Um, let me then bring this right over to Professor Nini, if, if that's okay. Wait. Um, yes, for closing remarks. Um, yeah. and let me share this over to Professor Nini, and then I'll pass it back to Rajni. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lasru. Yes, and thank you for our colleague, um, Tassa Evera. I actually, I agree with you 100%. Actually, what we would like to change the world should start from us. So your idea is, you know, really similar to ours, if not identical. Therefore, each and every one of us should connect and try our best in the place where we are. So we start from self and then family, then the neighborhood, then the town or village, and so on and so forth. It is, we call it ripple effect. So we are going to do this ripple effect and you have our context and I could, how could I give you the email if? I have was from the commenters, yeah, I got it. Yeah, okay. Do you have a pencil and the paper right yes. now? Yes, I have. A for Apple, I for Iceland, W for William, E for Edward, D for Denmark, and a dot, AI web dot. L-E-A-D is lead. It's uh, the first word of leadership, lead, at deepmail.com. Please feel free to write to me. And once you write to me, I share with all our community because this conversation should continue, continue until we can reach out to those who need the water literacy. Like uh, Dr. Alexandro said, we are preaching the converted, but still, I think this has to start from here. Then we get the ripple effect. Thank you very much for your interest and uh, your idea. We like it very much. Thank okay. you. Uh, back to Rajni, please. So Rajni may have uh, frozen here for a moment, um, and so I'm just going to uh, jump in, um, and uh, hopefully she will be back in a moment, but we are about to wind down in any case, right? So she did uh, drop off. Um, <clears throat> so I put, <laughs> I actually wrote that little message uh, there. I had meant to write that just to Rajni, uh, but now everyone sees it. Uh, <laughs> So I don't think Violetta is here with us at this point. Um, and as she is the holder of the eco-civilization uh, movement, it would be wonderful to have had a few words from her. Let's remember also that this is being held and sponsored by the eco-civilization movement. So anyone who's interested in that should please go and explore more about the eco-civilization, which has a series of uh, actions, interactions, projects uh, like this. Um, this is about uh, water, uh, literacy, water consciousness, 
uh, and about water action, uh, just as Professor Nini was just saying. Uh, and there are other, of course, domains of interaction and of engagement uh, to create uh, and uh, engage with a world of uh, emerging the, the eco-civilization uh, that is coming. So thank you, Sonia, for putting into the uh, chat the link for the eco-civilization. You just have to type in the www and, the, and you'll be right there. Um, uh, I think Rajni is back. Um, and so I would uh, pass it to her if she is active um, and can speak. Uh, we are, we have six minutes and then we will be closing the, the seminar in any event. Can we hear you, Rajni? No, not yet. So she sounds like she is, it looks, we can see that she is there, at least an image. Um, why don't we do this? Just if we go around and I would ask each of the speakers, and let's go in the order. We'll start then, I think, uh, with uh, me, because I was after um, the uh, the presenter who we... Um, this Alice. Alice, yes. exactly, as Boomen and Dentoner. Um, and so I will go, then Sonia, then uh, Professor Nini, and then Feriel. Just uh, one sentence, a couple of words maximum. Now Rajni is back. But um, um, Rajni, I've, I've got ahead and taken over. <laughs> <laughs> thank um, you, thank you. No worries. Can we do that? Uh, I think for me, um, the, 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 set, the word would be um, enthused and engaged. This is what I would like. I mean, this is, again, a celebration. So I'm not going to say more because I want it to be short. I'm now going to pass this then uh, to um, Sonia. Yeah. Thank you. For me, the words are two, confluence and flow. Confluence of ideas, thoughts, and with this, we can create a flow. Thank you. Uh, the okay. next is Nini. Yes, yeah. Nini. My four words do as we preach. <laughs> Mine would be. I was going to choose flow, Sonia, <laughs> but mine would be wisdom and flow. Move forward in wisdom and flow. Just like water, look for what is emerging and go do that. <laughs> I was sure, Feriel, that yours would be stop, uh, reset, and go. But okay, <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I'm going that's to, wisdom uh, too. <laughs> good. And I'm going to share, of course, the flow. And for those who haven't seen, I'm wearing the flow shirts now. But yes, this is the well, that's where that's where Sonia and I got it from. <laughs> I was nice. about, yes, flow. <laughs> and Rajni, you have heard and listened to all of this. So maybe the, the final words will be with you as you uh, conclude our seminar today. Uh, being somebody who comes from a country where every water body is bully be it a glacier, be it a well, be it a pond, be it a, a ocean. For us, every water body is bully. Every water body is worshipped in our country, literally, I'm telling you. So for me, the way I think one common factor that one common thread that I see in all the presentation is of spirituality. So I feel that through spirituality, through responsible behavior, by taking responsibility, because when we are talking about right responsibility and right, they go hand in hand. So yes, we must integrate this element of right and responsibility together. And uh, we definitely do not see. I, I always believe that water management more than natural disaster, it is man-made disaster because it's either poor management or poor practices or redundant technology, which is causing, of course, irresponsible behavior as well. So this is the final word for me. Uh, so I think we're done. Uh, Rajni, is there any uh, word you would like to say as we conclude? Uh, so I would definitely love to thank you all the wonderful speakers for their time or for their, their valuable insights. Of course, Dr. Alexander Laszlo, I don't have words to express my gratitude towards you on behalf of eco-civilization. And uh, for all the participants for being with us, for their time, for their interest, and for those participants who ask questions. We definitely encourage more and more participation by our participants. 
and uh, we always request our viewers to visit www.ecocivilization.eu for further events and their details. And we always thank, thank them. And thank you to all uh, uh, viewers. Thank you to all speakers. Thank you to Dr. Alexander for joining us today. And we will definitely see you next time with better ideas, with better management practices as suggestions, and maybe, possibly, hopefully, with better situation that the world is facing currently. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much, you. sir. Thank you so much, Nini. Thank you, Ferial. Thank you, Sonia.